There's a lot of different ways we could broadly assess a diet's quality. In this video, we're going to talk about some of the ways by which dietary quality can be assessed. And we're going to focus in on food processing as one matrix to quantify the quality of a particular diet. We're going to talk about some of the broad metrics that can be used to assess diet quality. We're going to talk about why we process foods and what are the typical changes that occur when foods are processed. We're then going to use something called the NOVA scale to describe whether a food is considered processed or not. We're then going to evaluate some of the evidence about whether food processing may play a role in obesity. There's a variety of different indices by which we can assess diet quality. One of these is called the DQI, or the Diet Quality Index. In this case, there's five different dimensions. You assess what is the variety of different foods somebody eats? What is the variety of different protein sources that somebody eats? Is their diet nutritionally adequate? Are they meeting the DRIs for macronutrients and micronutrients? Is there a moderate intake of saturated fat, salt, and cholesterol? And is there a balance between macronutrients and fatty acids? This can be used to broadly assess a population's diet quality. Another index by which you could think about the quality of a diet is how much of that food is considered processed. So we're going to talk more about what food processing does and how it can be measured. So let's take a carbohydrate, for example a wheat grain. The natural grain contains three important pieces, the endosperm, the bran, which is an outer layer that contains high levels of fiber and often some B vitamins and antioxidants, and the wheat germ, which contains more antioxidants, including vitamin E, and sometimes some healthy fats. Now, the whole grain is often difficult to work with. It may not work well in cooking, it may not be very stable on a shelf, and it may not taste as good. So a process of refining occurs, where the bran and the germ is extracted, leaving just the endosperm, which contains most of the carbohydrates and the proteins. Again, this has a lot of advantages. The refined grain might be more shelf-stable, it might be easier to cook or bake with, and it may be cheaper and easier to move. However, you've now lost all those micronutrients that were present in the bran and the germ. This is one example of food processing. This occurs for other foods in addition to carbohydrates. For example, meats. Meats can be consumed in their natural form, or they can be cured, salted, smoked, or dried. This can improve stability and transport, and this includes things like bacon, hot dogs, sausages, and meats. Often now, the chemical nature of the processed meat is different. It may have additives, and may have been changed by the smoking or the drying. Another example of this is processed oils. For example, avocado oil or canola oil. These are oils that are extracted from the natural food and can be used as culinary ingredients and added to other foods to improve their taste. So how do we quantify whether a food is processed or not? One useful matrix is the NOVA scale. So let's go through what this looks like. Level one is unprocessed food. So these are minimally processed foods generally eaten in their natural state. This could involve removing of things such as stems or bones and cooking, including boiling or cooking over a grill. This includes things like eggs or fish or fruits and vegetables. They are generally in their intact form. However, if you now extract something from that food, you are now a processed culinary ingredient. The example I gave before was avocado oil. You can extract the oil out of an avocado, and that oil can be useful for a number of things. That avocado oil is now a category two, whereas the avocado was category one. Category three is now where you take something that has a substantial amount of category two and add it to something in category one. For example, let's say you take the fish, but then you put a coating on top of it. Now that's a processed food, category three. Category four, on the other hand, is now mostly processed ingredients. For example, if you look at a pizza, it might contain cheese, flour, pepperoni. All of these are either category two or category three ingredients, mostly category two ingredients, but there's very little original unprocessed food in it. When a food is mostly based on category two and three ingredients, now it is considered ultra processed or category four. In most Western societies, much of our diet is ultra processed foods. And in most Western societies, obesity rates have increased substantially as our ultra processed foods in our diets have increased. Is there really a relationship between obesity and ultra processed foods? Well, let's look at some of this evidence. First, let's look at what an ultra-processed food diet might look like compared to an unprocessed diet. What I'm showing you here is a study that was done in Brazil. What they did was they categorized people into five different quintiles, depending on how much of their calories they get from ultra-processed food. Quintile one gets the least of their calories from ultra-processed food. 
whereas category five gets most of their calories from ultra processed foods. They then looked at the entirety of their diets and asked what are the differences in people who eat high versus low ultra processed foods. If we go left to right across the quintiles, you can see that diets that contained more energy from ultra processed foods tended to have more energy. That energy tended to be more dense, there was more calories per gram. They tended to have higher sugar, but they also tended to have less protein and less fiber in their diet. These are key characteristics of ultra processed foods. They tend to be high in sugar and salt, but low in fiber and protein. So how does this relate to obesity rates? Again, here's another cross-sectional study done in Brazil. They broke people down into four different quartiles based on the percent of their calories that were from ultra processed foods. As you go from quartile one to quartile four, there's more ultra processed food in their diet. If you look at the column on the right, that tells us the prevalence of obesity amongst these individuals. In Brazil, the obesity rates increased from 9.8% in people who ate mostly unprocessed foods, compared to the fourth quartile, where that increased to about 13.1%. This suggests that there's a relationship between the amount of ultra-processed food in your diet and your risk for obesity. But does this mean that obesity is caused by ultra-processed foods? Well, not necessarily. This is an observational cross-sectional study. This isn't looking at changes over time, and there's no intervention being done here. In fact, it could be that people with obesity prefer ultra-processed foods, and that's the direction of causality. Unfortunately, right now we don't have a large randomized controlled study where people were randomized into a group that ate ultra-processed foods versus unprocessed foods for a long period of time, so that this question can be addressed directly. However, what we do have is a shorter-term study that suggests that this might be true. So let's take a look at that study. In this study was something called a double crossover. That means patients were randomized into either an ultra-processed diet or an unprocessed diet for two weeks. During that time, they were given unlimited access to food. They were then followed for those two weeks and then switched at the end of those two weeks to another diet, the opposite of what they were on before. If they were on the unprocessed diet, they were switched to ultra-processed and vice versa. These diets were very intentionally generated such that both the fiber levels and the protein levels were actually quite well matched between the diets although they did differ in their processing levels. So what happened? If you look at the graph on the left, you can see that the people, when they were put on the ultra-processed diet, tended to consume quite a bit more calories, about 500 calories per day more of food than when they were on the unprocessed diet. As you would expect, since they're consuming more calories, people on the ultra-processed diet tended to gain weight, gaining about a kilogram over the course of those two weeks. On the other hand, People on the unprocessed diet lost weight. They lost about a kilogram over two weeks. Now this is highly suggestive that eating an ultra-processed diet makes us eat more calories over time. However, there's two limitations to this study. One is that the study's quite short-term. They only followed the people for two weeks. We don't know what would have happened if these people were on the diets for six weeks or six months or five years. We can make some projections, but until a longer-term study is done, we can't know for sure. The second limitation is in this study, as I said, the protein and fiber content was well matched between the two diets. This was done to avoid the confounding of those two factors that are important for satiety. However, if you compare this to real world unprocessed and ultra processed diets, as we showed before, ultra processed diets tend to be lower in fiber and tend to be lower in protein. So that means in the real world where those things are not well matched, it could be the effect is even bigger. In summary, there's a number of different ways by which you can assess diet quality. In this video, we went through one way, which is food processing. The NOVA system is a useful system for categorizing foods based on their level of processing. Imagine a food that you've eaten recently. Where do you think that would fit on the NOVA scale? Ultra-processed foods tend to have the properties of being more calorie dense, higher in sugar, salt, and saturated fats, but low in fiber and protein. As such, these higher ultra-processed diets tend to be associated with obesity rates. And we went through one short-term clinical study that showed when given unrestricted access to ultra-processed foods, they tend to consume more calories than when they're provided with unprocessed foods.